Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Office 365 Dev Pulse. I'm your host, Scott Hillier, and uh, before we get started on any of our technology discussion here, as always, I want to give a big thanks to Microsoft for their support. We wouldn't have this show without them. Today, we have as our special guest, Senior Product Marketing Manager, Jeremy Thake from Microsoft. Jeremy, why don't you join us? There you go. How about on the screen? There he is. Hey. Great, <laughs> great to see you. It's always, it's always something when you get started on these things. So uh, Jeremy's the uh, the Senior Product Marketing Manager for Microsoft, as I said. And uh, this week, we had a big online developer event, Connect, with a lot of great announcements. And uh, there was some time in that event, of course, for uh, for some of the office announcements. But what we wanted to do is take some additional time to really focus on those office developer announcements that happened this week and uh, basically be able to put you on the hot spot, Jeremy, and, and ask, yeah, you, uh, right. ask you some that's questions about what's going on and, and what, what we should be focused on. Um, if people have questions as we go along, there's a, there's a question pod that you can use as an attendee. Go ahead and put them there and um, we'll be able to see those and, and answer them as we go along. So, uh, so Jeremy, let's go ahead and get started. I mean, everybody really in the Office and SharePoint community knows who you are, but I thought I might start out by asking you to tell us one non-technical thing about yourself we don't know already. Ooh, God, that's a tough one. Um, I am a major car nut. I uh, travel to a lot of the Formula One and IndyCar races, actually with other tech people, in actual fact, and that's kind of my uh, total escapism, well, as far as away as I can get away from tech is uh, attending these races and it's a lot easier now I live in Seattle to get to a lot of these Formula 1 races than when I was living in Western Australia where we were the most isolated city in the world and every flight was at least a six hour flight away to get anywhere which was essentially just the other side of Australia before you could even get anywhere else in the world as well. Right. Yeah. So what, what drew you to F1? Um, well, since a kid I've always been involved uh, and followed racing and um, just really just always used to sit there on a Sunday and watch the races with my parents and and just kind of continue through throughout my life wherever I was in the world to sit and watch the races on a Sunday. Not Great. as exciting these days as what, what it was in the past with Senna and Prost and Mansell and those guys. I'll, I'll say that much, that's for sure. So the uh, the talent not as good as it has been in the past? Yeah, right? and I think actually that uh, although I'm a tech guy, I'd much rather those guys be flying around in um, with go-karts without all the technology they have to assist them as they're racing around the track. Right, right. Well, it's great. See, that wasn't so hard. Now we know something about yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. right. If that's the hardest question of the day, I'll be happy. There you go. <laughs> so um, so let's talk a little bit about Connect uh, this week, the uh, the two days, the presentations, and uh, tell us a little bit about how Office did at that event. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we've been very clear and transparent with, like, my podcast that I do every week and uh, with the ways we have our blog in terms of, what our announcement schedules are going to be like. We have this notion that we'll always do big announcements at build, which is, uh, you know, this year was beginning of April, or the, the next year is going to be the end of March. Um, same place, San Francisco. And so we always plan to have a bunch of stuff piled up that we can do a big announcement at build. But we wanted to do it twice a year, so it was a, a sixth monthly thing. And, and last year we had Tech Ed Europe as that stage where we did that. Um, which was which was exciting, and this year we decided to do rather than um, land at an event in person, we decided that we would basically be part of the announcements that the Visual Studio and the Azure guys do with the Connect event as well, and I guess Windows as well. Uh, you know, main reason to do that was we tend to communicate directly with just the Office and SharePoint audience, and we saw Connect as an opportunity to be part of the overall kind of Microsoft developer announcements, much like we do at Build, and um, hopefully get some people excited outside of our usual audience um, looking at building Office add-ins or calling the Microsoft Graph. So it was a great stage for us to be part of, and it was really cool seeing people like Scott Hanselman in the keynote demonstrate our APIs and Office add-ins and so forth as well. So, yeah, the the Connect event was was strong for us. Um, if you if you missed it, and we did make a lot of noise around it, but if you did miss it, all of the keynotes and so forth are actually streamed. So you can go to um, visualstudio.com/connect2015, and all of the videos are available there, um, including the keynotes. 
but there's also, and that was run over two days, it was like a live stream, but there's also a bunch of Channel 9 videos, and I actually prefer these because they're by our engineers and Sonia Kopchev, who I work with in our, in our developer marketing team. Sonia kind of basically ran this event for, for our team, and she worked with engineers to produce like seven to ten minute videos kind of discussing each of the features at a, a very high level, just explaining what they were. So though the Connect, uh, sorry, the Channel 9 videos are um, extremely useful too, and you can get to those from the blog posts that we've, we've pushed out. So blogs.office.com, um, the, latest, <laughs> the latest developer post there um, it has got all the links off to all the videos. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the you know the flavor of Connect. It includes both traditional Microsoft and non-Microsoft developers. So what you might say, you know, Visual Studio developers and developers that are that are not using Visual Studio. And it was interesting for me to see Office within that uh, sort of framework. You know, yeah. it's becoming more and more important for really for everyone to kind of develop in this pattern going forward with uh, the exposure of the RESTful endpoints that we'll get to here in a second. Yeah, I think that the strategy as a company is just trying to bring these things all together and I think Azure AD is, is really helping us to do that. Having the fact that you can log into Windows 10 now and your device is with an Azure AD account, um, if your company is using Office 365 or a hybrid scenario where they're using Azure AD, essentially once you've got that understanding of I'm authenticated as Jeremy Thake, I can then go and call into any service. It doesn't just have to be the Office 365 services. Now, you would have noticed uh, with the APIs, we the big announcement was the Microsoft Graph, um, which is graph.microsoft.com, and that URL was what it was called when we first announced this in preview, um, which we used to call the Office 365 Unified API back in March of this year at Build. And one of the big things that's happened the last six months is, you know, are we going to continue to call it the Unified API or, you know, does it need to be called the Microsoft Graph to match its URL and the future intention of what that's going to be for, for us at Microsoft. And uh, we decided to, add, as part of the V1 announcement, call it the Microsoft Graph. And what this indicates is, if you, if you look at the moment, all of the endpoints, if you go to um, graph.microsoft.io, all of the endpoints are really Office kind of relevant, but um, there's going to be some huge kind of a, a additions to that. En the endpoints that will not typically be something that will be Office orientated, and so you'll be able to navigate not just to either Office 365 calendar and um, to your Outlook.com calendar using that graph.microsoft.com endpoint and your auth token, but you'll be able to go off to other services that aren't. Office division related, but could be kind of Microsoft Health division related or CRM related uh, and, and so forth, which is really exciting because it just m means that we're all kind of moving in that one direction and the API accounts we have at Microsoft will make sure that all of the APIs across Microsoft are the same so that as a developer, when you jump into any of our teams, you're not like working with the CRM API and it's different from the SharePoint API and different from the Outlook right. API and we're trying to hide the fact that there's a bunch of engineering teams that don't necessarily talk to each other here in Redmond. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think one of the messages that, that we've been trying to give people for a while is that everyone is a developer. It's just that you have a specialization in some area and what you're really seeing is that what it means to be a developer in the Microsoft world is starting to come together into one definable set of skills which is, um, it makes it easier, I think, on all of us developers, and also it, it actually gives us a bunch of new opportunities. For me, you know, I, I spent yeah. many years, over a decade, doing very specific SharePoint work, and as we all know, that, that was a very specific set of skills, but as I've made the transition to this new model, I've actually picked up some other work, and one of the projects that I'm working on is a, you know, web-based Angular system that's using REST services, that has almost nothing to do with SharePoint. It stores a few documents in, in the Office 365 world, but the rest of it, it, it isn't an Office thing, and yet I'm using the same programming approach I would use if it were entirely Office. Yeah, I, I've been a big proponent of, um, I, I guess, this, this thing that we've been kind of painted into a corner as a SharePoint developer or as an Office developer, where SharePoint was ASP.NET 2.0, it was kind of SOAP APIs for a long time, and then it was server-side APIs where we had .NET SDKs for them only. 
Um, and then with Office Web Add-ins, the same deal. Like if you're wanting to build for Office, you had to ha have .NET skills and be writing in VSTO inside Visual Studio. And I think with what we did with SharePoint Add-in model and the Office Add-in model, and with the APIs being more RESTful and OData based, we, we've really kind of moved to this thing that you're not so painted in the corner as a developer. And it's getting to the point where I think a lot of the community and the ecosystem is realizing that although you can call yourself a SharePoint developer or an Office developer, you, you're really kind of, you're blocking your ability to get other work in other areas of development. And I think by saying I'm a web developer that, or a mobile developer or both, um, that specializes or has an expertise in, in SharePoint or an expertise in Office add-ins is a much better approach to market yourself and from a career development side it gives you more opportunities and so I think with our technology stack moving to be more open and more towards what normal web developers and mobile developers are doing I think for your own personal development it means that you can start playing with those toys as they come out um, rather than going oh we've got to wait for SharePoint to be you know six years time before it can we can even touch Angular with Right. with SharePoint and, 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 and so forth. So I right, think from yeah. that, that side it's good and then from our benefit it means that we reach a much larger audience um, where web developers in the past were like we're not going to touch SharePoint development with a barge pole, we'll let the SharePoint guys do that. Um, right. And now to this point where you know we're getting there in that sense of a web developer it's a lot easier for them to jump on our stack and I think you've seen with things like our Yeoman generated for our office um, add-ins that that's definitely yep. the case where you don't need Visual Studio 2015 or 2013. Um, you can just use any code editor and a command line prompt uh, on your machine to build an Office web add-in. Yeah, I think that's a huge advancement. Now, with with the decision to use the term Microsoft Graph to reference the endpoint, graph.microsoft.com, can you provide some clarity around some of the other terms that have kind of been floating around, like... Um, we got a question here about Office Graph. I know. I can see my podcast co-presenter throwing curveballs at me in the Q&A window. Thank you, Rich. Um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so there is one thing that will confuse people, and we know, um, which is that the Microsoft, which is graph.microsoft.com, and there's uh, a new V1.0 endpoint now, um, is the GA endpoint. So there's there's things in there like mail calendar contacts. Um, drive, which used to be files, uh, right. that is now GA production supported. Um, but there are still some endpoints that are still in preview on the graph.microsoft.com slash beta endpoint. And one of those is actually the trending around and working with endpoints. Now, those two endpoints are actually what we, we know as the office graph. So we have a Microsoft graph, which is like that superset, the direct, the the all-encompassing thing, which used to be called the Unified API. And then we have the Office Graph, which is what powers the Delve experience when you're when you're in Office 365 or you're in the Delve app on your mobile device. Um, and so the Office Graph elements are being exposed via the graph.microsoft.com via this trending around and working working with Notion. And, and so, yes, we know Microsoft Graph, Office Graph, it's really just the product teams um, kind of standing by their guns that, well, we'd always call this the Office Graph. And personally, I'd love it if we just called it the Dell API, but, you know, it's above my pay grade, and um, we just have to live with that naming uh, nomenclature, and, and it, it won't take long for people to settle in on it. But I think what we'll find is is that people will just start talking about them, not in the sense of Office Graph, but in the sense of trending around and working with. And it just so happens that's powered by all the underlying goodies that Delve, Delve gives you. Right. Yeah, if you get some time working with it, then um, it, it becomes a little bit more clear. In fact, uh, do you want to take a look at it? Should we explore some of the endpoints? Yeah, and yeah. So if I just share my screen, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I think someone does this for me in the background, right? Some magic. Or have I got to do it on my... No, we can do this. There's a button up here that says change the presenter, and I will throw it to you, and... Oh, there you go, and then I can start mine. Did you get it? Uh, that awkward coming. silence while we wait till technology there you go. to. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. So just let me know when you can see my screen and. Um, We're there. I can see it right now. Too easy. So I just minimize all this. Go to webinar windows. Okay. So <clears throat> in terms of like where to learn about these things, 
obviously dev.office.com is like the one-stop shop for everything to do with um, Office 365 development all up. Um, and then, you know, we, we made some announcements and we, we have a, a major announcement on blogs.office.com and if you look for the post called Today at Connect, where we kind of introduce the graph.microsoft.com as part of that. And um, it's, it's pretty good kind of write-up of um, kind of explaining a very high level to a business what uh, what that means. And so bloggersoffice.com is really for all audiences to be able to grok what the graph means. But then also on dev.office.com blogs, which is more just for our developer audience, we go into a lot more detail about the extensibility news and it's more worded towards um, developer audience. So kind of see blogs.office.com as, you know, we're there with the IT Pro news and the uh, IW news um, and it's worded in that way, that language too be almost like my grandmother or my mother could understand it, whereas the <laughs> dev.office.com slash blogs, and uh, they both do read my blogs as well. Oh, actually, Sonia they read that do. one. They do read them. Yeah, I know. It's sad, isn't it? Um, and then dev.office.com slash blogs is more for that technical technical audience there as well, so it kind of talks a little bit more in detail about all the things that are available. Now, I think the most exciting thing and, and just kind of seeing all the response you've had on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and um, everywhere else that we kind of monitor is that people were super impressed by uh, graph.microsoft.io, which is essentially our website that we have to showcase um, the Microsoft Graph. And this is really kind of an iterative thing that we've done over the last two years where we've learned a lot from what developers really need um, from this perspective of being able to learn and explore the APIs. And, um, you know, you'll see that we've got a bunch of information there and we did even do uh, support our partners by promoting the people that are actually, you know, using our APIs already in their, in their products that they've got out there in our office store or even um, direct to market. And you'll see up the top here, um, if I zoom in, that, you know, we've got this notion of a getting started, all the documentation, um, we have this graph explorer, which I'll show in a moment, as well as this ability to do app registration straight from this website and all of our samples and SDKs. And <clears throat> what's really neat? Required uh, Lord of the Rings reference in the middle there. Yeah, and yeah, and so uh, Ina Arenas is kind of uh, the the main engineer, kind of driving this with with Rob Howard, and it was just kind of the the whole Lord of the Rings thing totally kind of. Took, took to go and we've, we've used that quite a lot and I know she has some fun within her presentations too in the channel own videos but it, it is really what it's about it's it's we don't want you to have to go and remember a bunch of different endpoints we didn't necessarily want you to just kind of use our discovery service endpoint that you used to have to do against our direct endpoints like outlook.office365.com um, we wanted you to just to hit graph.microsoft.com and, and just be able to get at everything and so um, what 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 we can see here is if I go over to this the overview in in the graph is it we've kind of come up with this nice set of common queries that we know that you're going to go away and do um, so you can see here you know like if it's as simple to get my email messages is just to go over to graph.microsoft.com/v1.0/me/messages and go and get that and I can go and kind of copy and paste this over and the graph. Um, is actually linked up the top here, the Graph Explorer, but I've got to open in a separate tab. And I can just kind of hit, hit this up and that will return the messages that are in my inbox. So if I um, zoom in here just to kind of prove this is actually working against my, my current inbox, is there's a, a MailChimp email here that it's, it's trying to render in this, in this JSON viewer a little bit. But if I actually went over to my um, Outlook here, uh, just in Outlook.com, uh, sorry, outlook.office365.com. Um, <clears throat> you'll see here we've got the MailChimp um, emails. <clears throat> oh, actually, I just deleted that before I started this session, so that graph calls caching. But if you scroll down to the next one, hopefully if I just show you that, um, that you know, the, the, the calendar invites and so forth are coming through in the messages. And I can get to things like um, calendar slash events in here as well. And it's going to start returning me my events. So, for instance, I've got an event that's um, IT Unity webinar with Scott, and uh, it starts at um, UTC time of seven in the evening, which is 11 a.m. here in 
um, PDT land, and you can see all the different kind of bits of content that I can get through just in this JSON response. And so the Explorer allows me to kind of see the raw output. I can flick over to the JSON view here and and like start digging into each event and, and scrolling through here. And it's you know it's a lot easier to read in this JSON viewer as well. Um, so that's that's really neat in that sense that the graph allows you to jump through and, and try a different amount of endpoints. And so <clears throat> I can come over, you know, for instance, and even go through to my OneDrive files too. So I can kind of grab that and oh, paste in there, and that's going to return me back all of those results. And the nice thing about the Explorer is, is that I can then pivot a little bit. So if I go to this JSON view, you'll see there are all the files in my OneDrive for this, this test tenant and um, it's returning back all this information. But what it allows me to do is, if I really wanted to, I could jump in via this Glove Explorer and like explore my OneDrive for Business location and see what's in those, those particular folders or um, go directly to that document URL in the, in the raw sense and drive in and, and, and push that through. And so it's really neat in that idea that um, it's they're very, very simple in terms of everything that's on that v, V1 endpoint. And the really powerful part about this documentation, and if I just zoom out so that it renders correctly, um, is that I can jump and have a look at this reference documentation all here about things like my mail, uh, contacts, calendar, uh, my, my directory instances, and all the, the, the drive implementations as well in terms of kind of getting all of the children in the root of my OneDrive and, and what that looks like. But if you've got feedback about the documentation, what you'll see when you when you scroll up to the top here, and we will add this to all the pages, is this is all coming from GitHub. So if I jump over here to this tab, all of this documentation is actually um, inside this GitHub repo. And so the nice part about this is, is that we have information in here that shows you how you can contribute. So you know, if you want to kind of make a difference here and you've got maybe a, some additions to the documentation you want to add or a whole new page that you want to add, it talks to you about how you can fork the sample and um, essentially submit these things as pull requests. And we've even gone to the, the, the kind of the depths of explaining exactly how you fork and how you branch and how you contribute back and push those That's things great. through. Which is which is really nice. So we we hopefully this is going to evolve, and you'll see even in the issues section, you know, people have been submitting, and some of these are external, and some of these are internal. Like you can see Wardek, who is a you know a, a long term SharePoint MVP, has posted yep. a few bits of feedback already, and we've got people actioning those. Like you can see here, there's a there's a bunch of comments on here from Dan Kershaw, who's one of the engineers behind Azure AD, and and so we you know we, we're interacting a lot closer with people than we ever have done by providing documentation in, in this approach. Okay, great. So we have a question here about what happens as the Microsoft Graph grows. So can you talk to us a little bit about the thought process behind making new entities for the graph versus adding functionality to existing entities? You know, what what's the plan? Uh, yeah. As we so what, what I was getting at here is we have this V1 reference, and then now that's in uh, general available mode. And, and so the essence there is that um, up until this point, we've been in preview. And so everything was on the beta endpoint. And so very recently, if you noticed, uh, when we were on um, dev.office.com slash blogs, you would have seen us um, posting things such as updates on updates, you know, one, two, and three. And so, for instance, if I showed you update three here in preview, we changed the name of user.folders to mail.folders and right. changed a bunch of things to photo rather than user photo, contact photo, and group photo. Now, we had the ability to do that because we were in preview. And, and we, you know, this is why we don't recommend you calling any beta endpoints in your production um, products or end user solutions that you have for your customers and that you know if you're going to production you really need to just be using one um, and if you really really have to then you're gonna have to be very tight on our announcements around beta. Now our beta we had a bunch of additional things in here so for instance tasks. Now in, in uh, for instance with a task that's using planner in the background so that's a whole new um, endpoint that we've introduced 
And so you can do things like users with the user ID slash tasks or me slash tasks and it'll return all the tasks that are available in Planner. Now, Planner is still rolling out. So in that instance, if I went over to um, my current um, tenant I'm using to demo off of right now, is um, I don't have Planner in this environment yet because it hasn't been rolled out to my, my tenant. So if the things like that, they're in preview, you, you know, you've got to be patient, the, the product gets there, and that means the APIs are not going to be there. But once you have Planner, you'll be able to use these APIs to kind of call into those things. Now, we will evolve and change, much like we did with the previous preview endpoints that are now directly in V1, um, based on that feedback we get. And that feedback can be given either via user voice, um, or it can be given um, directly in the GitHub repo as issue. So if you feel like maybe this is not how you would expect it to work, or you, you would expect the response of a task to come back a little bit differently, we, we want to hear that feedback on these preview endpoints. Now, the question about, okay, so we've got a V1 endpoint here, and for instance, we've got this list children aspect here of how we're going to go and call these APIs to get the OneDrive files back for an individual user. We, we're, we're contracted now that that will not change. Um, the only way that we could ever say change drive item slash ID slash children um, would be if we decided that we wanted to completely re refresh the drive API. Um, and to do that, we would have to make that a V2.0 endpoint of Microsoft Graph. Right. If we add additional methods or properties um, that aren't breaking changes, we will actually do those on this v, V1 endpoint. And that was something that was decided by the Microsoft API Council um, when we were talking about kind of the strategy of versioning on these APIs in the future. Now, you know, there, there are two schools of thoughts here, like why don't you just keep versioning and versioning and versioning every time that happens, um, but it becomes very hard to track, and even now, between having a V1 and a beta, sometimes people get confused on, oh, hang on, I can't call search on one or the other, and it's because, right. no, this is a preview endpoint that that's available on and not a V1 endpoint. So we tried to, where we can, keep the V1.0 um, and only introduce kind of V2.0s for, for breaking changes or major refactorings of the API, which, you know, we don't really intend on, on, on majorly, majorly doing there. Um, and so, you know, these beta endpoints will all eventually end up as inside of V1, and then we'll continue to iterate on things like um, users, um, which exists in V1 as well, as we add additional um, new functionality in, into here. And a nice thing is, is we can actually get at um, the metadata of these things just by doing a dollar metadata and seeing kind of the description of the API shapes as well as kind of looking at this documentation as well. Now, in the future, and I've been talking to some engineering teams, we will also have this notion of a change log um, that shall be available at dev.office.com and you'll be able to subscribe to it, uh, like the RSS feed, um, so that as and when we push out new changes to this API, uh, you'll be able to see exactly what's changed, what the shapes are, and we'll link off to the documentation so you can see it. We're well aware that this, this approach right now with um, putting it in blogs isn't the most efficient for you guys. Uh, for now, that is the way that we're going to do it, and there is an RSS feed for these blogs, but we do want to get a lot more granular so that if you, you're only using the Outlook Mail API within graph.office.com, graph.microsoft.com, that you'll be able to just subscribe to the changes for that particular uh, endpoint within graph.microsoft.com, and, and, or maybe mail and contacts and calendar you're interested in, but you know if, if the SharePoint endpoints that will eventually be on graph.microsoft.com um, start changing, you don't want to be notified about those things. So we, we, we're grabbing a lot of feedback from a bunch of partners and MVPs in the community around what you guys really want from a, a change log, and, and that will be the way that we communicate with you guys moving forward on that. That sounds great. Now, um, this is great for, uh, you know, sort of getting an idea about what's there and using the documentation, but what if I want to take this now and, and begin to create something? So, you know, what, yeah. what pieces do I need and, and what's the process I follow? Yeah, so we, we have a few things to kind of help you there. Um, the first thing is in dev.office.com in the getting started, well, the guys in the team did a great job of getting this ready right for launch this week. Um, and so I can kind of come in here 
uh, and there's still a few things to do, like in terms of that really should be in the Microsoft Graph, but when I click Getting Started, um, we have these steps, so I, I have the ability to try it out, so I can look at, you know, getting events and getting all contacts and files and so forth, and there's a few parameters I can do to get certain areas, and then when I click Try, that's actually going to return back what that would look like in, in the body contents. But what I can also do then is go, right, well, I'm an ASP.NET MVC developer, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to need to go and get Visual Studio, and if I'm on 2015, I'm going to need this link to download the tools. If I'm on 2013, I'm going to need that link. And then what's really nice is it'll even go as far as um, if I s sign in here with my account for um, whatever... Uh, tenant that I happen to be using, and I'm just going to grab my password here. Um, is that when I log into this tenant here, what that's going to do is um, it allows me to register an application. So I'm just going to do uh, IT Unity demo one, and I can say these are the permissions that I, 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 well, that I need is mail send for this example. And when I click register app, that's actually going to go and register that app for me in Azure AD, which is essentially saying that I have this client ID and secret there that I can use. Um, and but the, the beauty of this is, is I can click on this sample, and that will download me an MVC sample um, that's already pre-wired to this client ID and secret and then be able to F5 in and run that sample directly through here. So, so it's we, already we wired up with OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, and it's yeah. good to go. So, we have, yeah, so if I kind of extracted this from the zip, <clears throat> what you'll actually see is that I can just simply go and open this in Visual Studio, and if I F5 in that, like all of my wiring is done for me. I don't have to configure anything. So we see the, you know, the, the trying out the APIs as one exploration aspect. Uh, we see, okay, I want to get my hands dirty and see something running in my own environment. You can see that that was the client ID in secret that got pushed through. Right. Um, but we also know there's this next step, which is essentially, right, well, I've got my own project and I want to integrate into those APIs. And that's really where we go that little bit further now on going into training content. Um, I'm not save image when we're doing that. Um, and in dev.office.com training, we've got a bunch of great content there for uh, the APIs and for the add-in stuff. Now, I will say we're writing the process with the training content based on it being V1 on Wednesday of updating that. And so in the next uh, two or three weeks, we'll have all updated on-demand videos, hands-on labs, and slide decks for each of those endpoints, like mail, calendar, contacts, and and, and, and so forth. Um, so right now, these still kind of talk about the unified API, which are, is the preview endpoint, which is slightly out of date. And that's just the nature of the fact that we made that gut call to do training for the preview content um, that we, we probably won't do in future. We'll only do it for... G8 endpoints inside there. But we also go off to um, the references here, um, and also that we have tons and tons of code samples at dev.office.com slash code samples, which you can go and pull down as well, which use all those um, endpoints as well. And all of these are living in, um, in GitHub. And you can see here we've got PHP ones and Android ones and iOS ones yeah, as well. That's so great. There's a lot of ways to kind of go and start exploring this stuff. The training will be updated um, very shortly, but the getting started is going to be your immediate flow to kind of jump in and get a good idea of, of what you can do with these APIs across the different endpoints that we have in, in, in the V1 endpoint. So can you so, show us the code and the controller? I want to see what it looks like. Oh, you've picked on me now. Um, so inside of the controller here, if I go to the controller, you'll see that <clears throat> when I go and get the, the token here, and I'll just zoom in a little bit, um, we've made it really, really easy. We're pulling through the settings here of what we just kind of gone through. Um, and then once we've got that auth context called um, <clears throat> and, and, and running, we're, we're storing those things away. So that's what uh, we're saying as kind of a, here's our best practice way of um, storing those tokens to be used at um, a different different approach. Now, and in no terms of discovery service, and and no discovery service. Yes, yeah, so there's like not as much chattiness to go. Tell me okay. where OneDrive lives before I grab OneDrive, or tell me where Calendar lives before I call Calendar. And then inside inside the messages itself, I um, mean, in this instance, what this um, 
web application is doing is sending an, uh, an email message is that all I'm doing is, is calling off to um, that method, passing in the token that I've stored in the session um, with the generated email text here. So it's a nice, clean, um, nice and clean call. And then if I kind of went and had a look um, at that definition of, of what I'm doing to generate that email, all I'm really doing is just setting up this mail object that I'm passing through. So and is, is the, the code is significantly helper, cleaner. <clears throat> is Unified API Helper going to stay the name here? Yeah, the good question. Uh, you know, we are um, the, the Microsoft Graph naming was something we had to get approved internally. So over time, you'll see. I mean, even here, uh, you know, the Microsoft Graph API has been changed in the comments. But I'm guessing the guys weren't confident enough to do a uh, um, a, a refactor of the name here. But it, it is probably on their list. It just wasn't a priority to get these samples updated to the new endpoints in time for the ship this week. That's okay. We dealt with webs and sites for a long time. So. <laughs> it definitely won't be as long to refactor webs and sites as it was to refactor Unified API to Microsoft Graph, that's for sure. <laughs> Great. So um, here's a question we've got about um, just discovering what people have capabilities for. So um, all the tenants might not be the same that you're talking to. Is there a way in the graph at all to, to find out what uh, is supported in a tenancy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's something we're, we're, we're looking at doing. Um, you can see from the V1 endpoint that we we don't have that right now. Um, and I know it's on user voice that this is ability of saying, like, tell me whether Planner exists, tell me whether... So rather than me calling the task API and getting an error because Planner isn't in their um, tenant yet, you'll be able to do those checks. And so there's some work we've got to do there that isn't there right now. Um, so just kind of bear with us on that one, but it is something that is on the, on the roadmap for sure. Okay, great. Great. Okay, well, just looking at our time and knowing we've got a couple of other things to uh, to cover, do you want to move on a little bit and talk about yeah, what's going on yeah, with Alpha Saturday? Enough of the graph. Graph gets too much cool attention. The press have been all over it all week, but I, I think that if you go back to the, the dev.office.com post that we had, um, if I just go back to just blogs here, the detailed blog that we have that's kind of all of our extensibility news, um, you know, it is great that we've got a bunch of new APIs and I'd highly recommend having a look at this API which is being deployed at the moment, which is a content API that allows you to actually manipulate Excel documents living in OneDrive or SharePoint to do things like um, add, um, add, a work, um, add a sheet to a workbook or manipulate content within a particular sheet and um, formatting and um, adding charts into uh, pages as well. So I know this is something that people have got very excited about and um, much like the word automation services that used to live inside of SharePoint server, that's kind of where we're going with this and the Excel one is the one that took priority over Word and, uh, and PowerPoint there. But do expect over time that we'll have a Word REST API and and a PowerPoint REST API as well, where you don't have to download the file from OneDrive or SharePoint, manipulate it on inside of your uh, memory, and then re-upload it. You'll just be able to use this API endpoint to do that. So that, that for me, was really, really exciting. That and is. I think the, the big one for me, which uh, I was quite amazed about, and you'd have probably seen me have this open earlier on, is the connectors. And there's a great video by Naveen Chand on um, Channel 9, that um, and that links there. Um, to, to that, but if you go to dev.outlook.com slash connectors, and there's just one thing you need to do, which is grab this string, which is enable connector dev preview equals true, and I've already done this in my um, my Outlook groups for this, this tenant I've got, and what will happen is when you do that is it lights up these connectors here, and is, this is a new preview feature inside of Outlook groups, and there are a bunch of connectors in here, whether it's uh, Bing News, GitHub for notifications, Jira for notifications, or Twitter, um, and even RSS feeds. So, for instance, in our internal Microsoft tenant, um, which I obviously can't show you because there's a bunch of NDA stuff going on in there, um, I've added uh, my pod, pod show, uh, what I do with Rich. So, inside of every single podcast that we do, we, we, um, we link off to, so for instance, this one this week we did with Chris O'Brien on SharePoint, you can grab this, this RSS feed um, directly from the show here, um, and I can just say, I want for this group, I'm going to add an RSS notification, 
And what that will mean is that every time our, me and Rich do a new podcast, it will go and post to this group um, <clears throat> a, a, no, a new conversation around that new podcast. So you'll see it's already picked one up, um, or it essentially said that it's created that, that, that podcast. So next Thursday, when we post a new one, we'll have another conversation thread here that says, you know, Jeremy and Richard have posted a new podcast, and we're actually doing it with Sonia on all the announcements we've done around Connect. But then you can start having discussions here and going, you know, I love the, the Office 365 developer pod show, uh, podcast. Um, Jeremy is much better than Richard. There you go. I get my taunt back after him throwing questions in the Q&A. Um, and so it allows me then to kind of have this conversation. Other people can like my comments. And what I can actually do as well is even include, you know, people that might not necessarily even be in this group. So, for instance, Julie Kremer here that's external can then join this conversation. Uh, sorry, external in, in the sense that she's, she's not joined this group, but she's part of our organization and can join that conversation as well. So it's a great way of having this, this notion of connecting to other services and, and having conversations happen around them. And we're using it for things like Bing News, um, having alerts around particular topic areas. Um, I know already, um, you know, the fact that we have a bunch of really good activity in GitHub, we're having groups where we can kind of have conversations around the GitHub activity and, um, and, and the same thing with, um, with Twitter as well. So, but the really, really cool part about this is, is that this is extensible and it's very, very simple to do. And there's some great getting started content here on, on how you go about um, essentially registering your own connector and then the, uh, the information that you need to put together for the webhook to push to the groups when when those things are subscribed. Um, so this ability to say, for instance, if you have your own custom CRM system, you could build your own custom connector that you subscribe to, and then it could post to that group via this webhook. Um, so it's really neat, and you know the Trello example is here. So all of those connectors I just dem you know, showed you in that list are using um, this 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 uh, this approach, but you can go and create your own connectors as well. So I'm I'm really excited to see um, what people will build. We are looking currently at putting together a bounty list of connectors that people are looking for. And so often we get from the community like, we want to help, but we're not sure what to, what to build. Um, you'll actually be able to go to this bounty of connector lists. And, and we're actually going to do it with code samples as well to give you some ideas and some inspiration of things to go away and do, which is really neat. Yeah, that is some really cool new tech right there. That's going to be yeah. uh, great to play with. Yeah, and it's exciting how quickly that the Outlook Group stuff is um, innovating on things as well. So um, just shows you how competitive that we can get against some of the other people out there in this space um, around kind of collaborating in this, this group's notion and having files associated with groups and a calendar that lives in the Exchange store and, and this notion of a OneNote notebook and, you know, having your members that are essentially just an active directory group in the background. So it's a really nice way of kind of grouping things together and their mobile apps come a long way um, in the last few months as well. Um, the other one that's really, really exciting and, and we've seen a lot of news around this is if you go to dev.office.com, the Office UI fabric, mm -hmm. the fabric team have done an amazing job and we shipped this two weeks ago um, of putting together some documentation around what Fabric is and what's available to it. Now, Fabric was based on feedback we had both internally and externally, and you'll hear us use this phrase of uh, first and third party. And what we mean by that is that this Office UI Fabric that we've open sourced in GitHub um, is actually used inside our own products. So when you look at OneDrive here, um, a lot of these UI elements are actually, if you went in F12 and had a look inside of the JavaScript and the HTML, is leveraging the UI fabric. Um, and so our own engineers, I'm trying to remember what tab I was on now, um, our own engineers is actually leveraging fabric. And what that means is if the engineers are trying to do something with their user inter interface or OneDrive or uh, Outlook Mail, um, and it's not capable of doing it, they'll work with the Fabric team to go and do those components or those stylings or the layouts that we require. And if you go over to components here, you can see we've got a bunch of things here. So I can kind of scroll down and one of the big ones that I like using is this notion of a persona card. So something we're all familiar with in Outlook um, where you can see like it's got this 
this styling that we're used to inside of Outlook um, directly inside of this area. So I'm, as I'm clicking on, you know, styling link calls and messaging, but also you can go and look at the job, uh, sorry, the HTML that is required for it. And a lot of it is just simply leveraging a bunch of classes um, that you that we've put together as well as this notion of then having some JavaScript in the background that wires up some of those elements so that they're bound correctly um, to that particular component. And there's things that are a lot more simple, such as you know drop-down lists as well. So if I went to drop-down lists here, you can see that it's got a particular styling. And the reason we're doing this is we've got a lot of feedback from end users of people that have built customizations that lived in standalone web applications that were launched by the app launcher or that live within like an office web add-in um, inside of Outlook, Word, PowerPoint, Excel that it didn't feel like a Microsoft product. It looked like the developers just kind of threw something together. So the <laughs> fabric really, really allows you to make your stuff look professional. And as an example of this, just to kind of um, highlight this, is if you go to dev.office.com hackathons, and we I've just been traveling a fair bit recently, and we, we did one in Europe, and one of the submissions here um, was actually a Delve classifier add-in um, <clears throat> uh, for uh, Word, PowerPoint, Excel. And I'm just going to, hopefully this, this works for you guys. I'm not sure where the video is going to uh, stream here. But if I just pause it on this video, what you'll notice um, it, as part of this video in, in the add-in, I, I don't have it running on my machine just yet, is that they use the um, Office UI fabric to style their add-in. And they only had 24 hours to build this. And so having this kind of styling allowed them to very quickly build something that looks super professional um, inside of um, Word, in this case, Word Online, um, yeah. using that fabric. So fabric's a great way of kind of making your add-ins, uh, whether it's SharePoint or Office, or even just standalone web apps, look and feel great because it's using Fabric. So you can go and get Fabric now, and there's a bunch of samples and tutorials that you can download um, to get a good idea. And we're actually going through all of the existing code samples we had and um, in line kind of updating those to use Fabric rather than their own implementations of UI design as well. Yeah, I would say that if you've used Bootstrap, then it's a pretty natural one step to the right and you're using fabric. You know, yeah. it supports in pretty much the same way. As long as you've got the documentation in front of you, you know, you can build out your grids and your components. And I've done a couple of projects with it and uh, I found it, as, again, as easy to use as, as Bootstrap was. Yeah, and I think the key here is, is that it can live alongside something like Bootstrap. Like, you can right. use Bootstrap for the layout, but if you wanted to use our components, that's fine. You can pick and choose which frameworks you use that sit alongside it. And that was an important thing because, you know, OneDrive and Outlook have their own frameworks they use because the engineering teams have preferences, and we right. wanted to build something that our first-party products could use as well as external third-party. Right. But the Fabric has a 12-column layout. It, yeah, it does, yeah. But, but I think the, the thing is, is if you've already used Bootstrap, yes, you could flip it to use ours, but if you didn't want to go to that effort, you could just continue to lose, use Bootstrap for the layout and then um, use, use the styles and components that Fabric provides. Yep. Yeah, I think the only, the only question I've been hearing, and it won't surprise you when I say this, is they like to have some of the components in frameworks like Angular uh, so that they're easier to use in my favorite framework. Yeah, so like for instance with, with Angular, having directives which are in Angular 1, but um, you know, they're not necessarily in um, Angular 2 so much. Right. Um, we're, we're working with a bunch of community people like Andrew Connell um, to kind of maybe do this as a community-led effort, um, but we're, we're starting to realize that maybe we need to have this as an engineering-based thing. So we're still looking for d demand on that, and there are user voice request. So if it's something that's really imperative to you, I'd highly recommend jumping into to user voice and providing your votes. And to get to user voice, if you just go up to dev.office.com, um, <clears throat> in the middle here on the community, there's a link right here to, to the user voice site where you can go and search for those things in here. So definitely worth checking checking that stuff out. Okay, great. Those are, those are good. I, I know we've only got a, uh, like eight more minutes, so I, I do want to give Office some more love. Um, and that's to say that, you know, we had some stuff in preview that we'd actually announced prior to Connect. Um, but we, we, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were very clear that we've added a bunch of new things to 
um, Excel and Word. And again, you can go and watch these videos by um, Juan and um, I think Umberto, oh no, um, Sky Lou did the, um, the Excel one. Um, where it will kind of demonstrate those in, in more detail. And the nice part is we've got a ton of samples already. So if you went over to code samples here and in the types filter by office add-ins, um, you can come over here for instance and search for um, Babylon here. And I've got this one already open. Um, it's this one here and if I just click play, um, you'll actually be able to run this up just by clicking F5. It doesn't have any setup at all. Um, and this one is nice because what it allows me to do is, this is a Babylon.js framework. Um, this is living in a content add-in that's running in Excel, but it's bound to the data here on the, the left-hand side. And if I launch that, that's going to start animating. And what this is is actually a representation of the Microsoft Paris office. And each of these individuals had beacons on them that was tracking their movements, like where they went sat down and um, maybe did some work on email and you'll see that some, I think at some point two people going to sit, sitting there which is uh, obviously they're having a meeting and there's a bunch of people in the reception area. But what this shows is, yeah, you could do this on a website on its own, but what I can also do is leverage the power of Excel, which is I can say just show me these three beacons, which essentially filters that just to um, 135 rows to thousands there before. And when I click launch now, I don't see all of the balls, I just see the ones I filtered to in Exchange, uh, in Excel. Now, the cool part about this is, is that that the kind of the world you limit there in terms of uh, what you wanted to do in terms of functions across this stuff or really smart filtering um, and, and coloring and, and all sorts of stuff to then allow this animation to be extremely powerful. And we're seeing a lot of vendors use this approach to bring more powerful visualizations than what you can get out of um, the, the data and the charting uh, that's available natively inside of um, Excel in, in terms of these types of charts. So these Excel content add-ins are a neat way of doing that. And so that definitely worth checking that Babylon Excel one out there for that instance. And then another example, if I just stop debugging this one, is if I jump over to the college tracker, uh, the college budget tracker, which is actually part of um, dev.office.com as well. You can go and search for that. And if I run this one up, same deal, we just need a kind of F5 in. And what this is showing, um, and it does highlight one thing that we do need desperately in Office JS, which is the ability to um, grow and shrink the columns, is that on the fly, this was from a blank worksheet has created all this content using just standard Office JS calls from this add-in on the right-hand side to create this content. But then in addition to that, I can do things like, well, I'm going to have a few beers and I'm going to spend 500 bucks on those beers <laughs> and I'm going to add that to my entertainment category. I mean, you're at college. That's really all you do is drink beer. Um, I love the fact that there's like financial aid of $500, which is clearly that should just be rewritten as, you know, parent income because um, <laughs> financial aid is essentially what that is. Um, and then what you'll see here is when I click add, um, that's gone on incremented the entertainment cell, but it's also updated this because what that is is just a sum of um, all of my expenses down the bottom. So you've got this um, power of um, leveraging the out-of-the-box ideas of Excel and noticing that these charts are changing. So if I went in and said like we had a really big bender, um, you'll see these charts change as well um, on the fly as these dashboards. And so this scenario really shows how you could have all sorts of different scenarios for a small business or for a team that are running um, tracking of things in Excel right now where they might be doing manually going through and adding these bits and having separate sheets for stuff and just have a, um, a form in their task pane that kind of starts to take away a lot of the pain in managing data in Excel um, via Office JS. And if we have a look at what that looks like in the background, essentially when I click the add expense um, button in the function here, what that's doing is um, it's using this new notion of excel.run um, and it's going and getting the items in the expense table, uh, which is the the table is basically bound to, to that table here. Mm -hmm. And all I'm doing is going, I'm going to add to that row in here um, the one that's called whatever is in that value of Excel description. So in that case, it's whatever I pick. Um, sorry, it's whatever I pick in, in here from the category. 
and it's going to pass through um, that cost. And so what that means is it's going to increment that value up. And so it's really neat from that sense that then all I do is do a dot sync and it pushes that from within um, my task pane here and then executes that inside of Excel. And the reason we do the dot sync is we, we realize that there was a lot of chattiness where it was communicating a lot left and right between the, um, the add-in living in the task pane and the actual sheet. And so the dot sync allows you to batch up commands. Uh, in this example, it doesn't kind of highlight the batch capability in all its power, but it's certainly something that we're, we're looking at doing. And Juan does a great demo, if you go and check out that video um, in that blog post, where he shows like, this whole concept or notion of um, document creation as well, where you can kind of inject paragraphs that are specially formatted directly into Word, just with simple HTML and JavaScript. Um, I will point out that you know a lot of our samples here, like this college, college budget tracker here, um, are running in um, in Visual Studio, but that's one great example where if I go over to um, code samples here, and do a quick search for that that budget tracker, um, and I have a look at this <coughs> inside of uh, inside of GitHub, what you actually notice is that we have two folders. We have one which is the code editor project, and one which is the Visual Studio project. So if you're not using um, Visual Studio, you can still use, uh, just kind of go and grab the code and run it. And what we're starting to do is revise these so that they're using the basis of what we do with our Yeoman generator um, to generate the scaffolding so that all you would do is go into that folder in the command prompt and fire off a node um, server by, um, by calling a gulp task and then uploading your manifest and you're, you're away and off to the races. So there's some really neat stuff that is coming to really improve you know, how you can get at our samples and, and how you can kind of experiment with them and, and kind of grab the code and use them in your, your own experiences as well. And in this, in this particular topic, I'd also put a plug-in for the Snippet Explorer that uh, you can get and put into Word and Excel and you can check out all the different things you can do with the API. Yeah, and so we've got some great documentation that kind of links off to all that inside the uh, the Office add-ins area here, and much like uh, the Microsoft Graph, and um, we've actually got this ability to contribute to your feedback on this reference documentation as well. So, you know, if you want to get at the body object, here's the documentation here. Maybe that description mm -hmm. isn't up to your liking, or it's got an error in it. You can actually come over to um, that Markdown page um, and raise an issue around that Markdown page and um, and if you want to, you could actually fork the repo, make the change and submit a pull request and our guys would actually look at it and uh, either accept it or ask for some more information before they accept it. So, yeah, we're really changing the way we are with our documentation moving forward. Excellent. Well, we're right at the top of the hour. Anything uh, you want to add in before we start to wrap up? I, I would just say from a, a call to action from this call would be to um, essentially go to uh, dev.office.com and, and, and check out this this um, this blog, the Accessibility News, and have a what, walk through um, these videos that we've linked to in each of these bits and pieces. Um, there's some great videos here, and obviously I can't cover it all in, a, in an hour conversation, but they're only 10 minutes, or they're up to 10 minutes long. Um, there's a really um, <clears throat> great one over there if you kind of jump into... Um, the, the article, uh, sorry, into Channel 9, you can actually go and see all of the videos from Connect as well. So they're not just Office, there's a, a bunch of other things in here as well, but you can just go over here and, and filter, by, um, filter by Office 2. Um, and we've even got, you know, G Rob Lefferts, who's a general manager of Office Extensibility, um, but you'll see there's a bunch of videos here that talks about all the different areas. Um, of, of what we announced this week at Connect. And um, the feedback we've had so far is having these quick kind of snack videos um, has allowed people to like learn very quickly, like this one from Juan here, uh, what's available in the new uh, Word APIs from the program managers that are actually building this stuff here in Redmond. So it's a really nice approach of how we're doing that moving forward with these, these uh, videos on Channel 9. Excellent, excellent. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much for spending an hour with us and, uh, and going over all these announcements. There's more than enough to keep us busy for quite some time. Uh, with yeah, it's, it's kept us on. busy for the last few months in preparing for this, and now we're just kind of excited for the barrage of questions that we'll get around 
um, how to use this stuff and what content we need to provide to make it even more easy for, for developers to kind of get going and ramped up on these things. And as I say, our training content will be coming and um, we'll have more and more samples as we press through too. Great. Well, then I guess it's time for us to get busy and start to uh, start to digest some of this. So yeah, no, no pressure. I want to see IT Unity's blog churning along with lots of great blog posts on all this stuff. Got a bunch of things lined up already. So we're also uh, recording this. So if folks missed it, uh, they can see it again. So make sure you, if you're here, you oh, I definitely tweet uh, that out. Yeah, know that uh, that you can see it again. And before we check out, I just want to once again thank Microsoft and uh, Jeremy for being here for an hour. Uh, our next Office 365 Dev Pulse is going to be sometime uh, in the middle of December here. We're working on a show around uh, forms technologies, so we'll look forward to that one as well. So, uh, so that's it for us at Office 365 Dev Pulse. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Once again, thanks, Jeremy. Cool. Thanks, man. Bye.